thank you very much for that, and uh, I'd just like to add my own welcome to Richard, and thank you very much for coming to Inverness today. It's great to have you here. Uh, we're going to plunge straight in. Uh, Richard, these days, as Bob was saying, you're probably best known for your book, The God Delusion. Um, created quite a stir with that. We're going to come on and talk about that later, and I'm sure the audience will have a thing or two to say about it, too. Um, but before that, you were best known, I think, and you're still very well known as a scientist who is so passionate about science and is able to express it and to convey the excitement of science even to a non-scientific audience. What is it about science that thrills you so much and makes you so excited about it? Science is true. By the way, I should apologize for my voice. I've lost it. <laughs> I don't know whether God has something to do with it, but I like to think it's become sexy and husky, but I fear that's a bit of wishful thinking. Science is the truth about reality. It's the truth about the real world in which we are fortunate enough to find ourselves. We are especially fortunate to find ourselves here in the 21st century living after Galileo, after Newton, after Einstein, after Max Planck, after Darwin, after Watson and Crick. That means that the picture of the world that we have to savour is more wonderful, richer, fuller than it was for any of our predecessors. It's an amazing privilege to be living at this time when science hasn't got all the answers but has got a really surprisingly and remarkably long way towards getting answers to understand why we exist, what the universe is all about, what life is all about. I feel thankful to be living at this time. And can you describe for us uh, perhaps one or two of the, the odder things that science has, has revealed and things that are particularly exciting and that particularly excite you? One of the oddest things that's happened really during my professional lifetime is the acceptance of plate tectonics. Mm. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, it was known as continental drift, and it was associated with the name of a German meteorologist called Wegener. And Wegener was pretty much ridiculed. What he noticed was that if you look at the outline of the west coast of Africa and the east coast of, of South America, and indeed the, the whole um, of the east side of North America as well, they make rather a neat fit. And he suggested that once upon a time, those two continents were abutting, they were joined up together. It was pretty much ridiculed, and when I was an undergraduate, my lecturer in ecology, Charles Elton, actually had a vote among us undergraduates. Voting is not, by the way, how scientists decide issues. <laughs> but nevertheless, I'm sorry to say he did this, and we were, we were split about 50-50. Since that time, in the guise of the theory of plate tectonics, uh, it is now absolutely accepted, there's no, not a shadow of a doubt, that over the last hundred million years or so, uh, South America and Africa have been gradually pulling apart. They were once touching. They've been pulling apart. It's been said at the speed with which fingernails grow. If that doesn't make the hair curl on the back of your neck, I don't know what will. Once upon a time, South America and Africa were touching. And they've gradually been pulling apart pulling apart and pulling apart. The evidence for it is totally conclusive. Uh, probably there isn't time to go in, into it, but obviously it's of the kind of evidence that you can't see directly. It's rather like a detective coming upon the scene of a crime after it's happened. You can't actually see the murder being committed, but what you can see is all the clues that remain. And in the case of plate tectonics, in the case of continental drift, the clues that remain are so overwhelmingly conclusive that nobody could any longer doubt it. And by the way, it completely knocks on the head the absurd idea that the Earth is only a, a, a few thousand years old. Thank you for that. I've actually got a different example of something from your books that made the hair on the back of my <coughs> neck stand up. And uh, I've given it to you there as, as a reading, which I'm going to ask you to do if your voice can take it. Um, and I'll tell you what it is. It's from a book called A Devil's Chaplain. It's where you describe the atomic structure of crystals. 
And this was something I have to say here. I'm no scientist at all. And uh, it was only reading Richard's books that made me take an interest in it at all. And actually, this was probably the first thing I read that made me think, oh, that actually is really interesting. And, and not only is it really interesting, but I can understand that. And because that had such a, a great effect on me, I'd like to ask you to, to read that for us now, if you would. I'll give it a go. If my voice starts to fail, I might hand it over to Paula to, to, to read. <laughs> In a crystal, such as quartz or diamond, the atoms are arranged in a precisely repeating pattern. The atoms in a diamond, all identical carbon atoms, are arrayed like soldiers on parade, except that the precision of their dressing far outsmarts the best drilled guards regiment, and the atomic soldiers outnumber all the people that have ever lived or ever will. Imagine yourself shrunk to become one of the carbon atoms in the heart of a diamond crystal. You are one of the soldiers in a gigantic parade, but it'll seem a little odd because the files are arrayed in three dimensions. Perhaps a prodigious school of fish is a better image. Each fish in the school is one carbon atom. Think of them hovering in space, keeping their distance from each other and holding their precise angles by means of forces that you can't see, but which scientists fully understand. But if this is a fish school, it is one that, to scale, would fill the Pacific Ocean. In any decent-sized diamond, you're likely to be looking along arrays of atoms numbering hundreds of millions in any one straight line. The military metaphor makes us think of each soldier as a metre or so from his neighbours. But actually, almost all the interior of a crystal is empty space. My head is 18 centimetres in diameter. To keep to scale, my nearest neighbours in the crystalline parade would have to be standing more than a kilometre away. But if solid things are mostly empty space, why don't we see them as empty space? Why does a diamond feel hard and solid instead of crumbly and full of holes? The answer lies in our own evolution. Our sense organs, like all our bits, have been shaped by Darwinian natural selection over countless generations. You might think that our sense organs would be shaped to give us a true picture of the world, as it really is. It is safer to assume that they've been shaped to give us a useful picture of the world, to help us to survive. In a way, what sense organs do is assist our brains to construct a useful model of the world, and it is this model that we move around in. It is a kind of virtual reality simulation of the real world. In the same way we find much of the universe, as science discovers it, difficult to understand. Einstein's relativity, quantum uncertainty, black holes, the Big Bang, the expanding universe, the slow movement of geological time, all these are hard to grasp. No wonder science frightens some people. But science can even explain why these things are hard to understand and why the effort frightens us. We are jumped up apes, and our brains were only designed to understand the mundane details of how to survive in the Stone Age African savanna. These are deep matters, and a short article is not the place to go into them. I shall have succeeded if I persuaded you that a scientific approach to crystals is more illuminating, more uplifting, and also stranger than anything imagined in the wildest dreams of new, new age gurus or paranormal preachers. The blunt truth is that the dreams and visions of gurus and preachers are not nearly wild enough. By scientific standards, that is. <laughs> I challenge anyone to look at a crystal in the same way after that. That's actually a nice lead-in to the next thing I want to ask you. You talked about um, our brains being evolved to view the world in a particular way. Um, evolution is, of course, your specialist subject. <coughs> Can you tell us, tell me, as a complete science beginner, and tell the audience about evolution, what it is, how it works, and more than anything, how can you be so sure that it is right? 